This is SciBite, episode 81, for February 12th, 2013. everyone, and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live Tuesday evenings and fresh Wednesday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. Okay, Heather, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to take a look at colorblindness, a bionic man, dinosaur-killing asteroids, smart pens, Alzheimer's, viewer feedback, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Wow, I have to say, this sounds like this entire episode was put together just to be relevant to my interest, Heather, so let's kick it off with the news. Okay, what's our first story? Okay, some researchers at 2IA Labs have actually developed some wearable eyeglasses that can effectively cure red-green colorblindness. Wow. So Which is there pretty are, much what I suffer from. Yeah. Now, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, there's a, sorry, a video in the show notes talks about, you know, shows a little video and says, hey, if you can see this number, then you're colorblind here or there. So it's kind of a, a test. Right. So some of them. So like right not- here, I. I'm I'm actually kind of failing a couple of these right now. <laughs> Great. So I'm just going to go ahead and fail on air. Wow, this one I don't see at all. Okay, so I don't see the three. Okay, I don't see this one at all either. I don't <laughs> so see, poor Chris wow. needs these glasses. Wow. Okay, I'm not seeing this one either. Some of them are a little hard to see even if you're not, but oh my sometimes gosh. it'll show you, it'll be like, so here's I, a five. And you look really again, you're like, oh, it? there's a five. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing any of these. So, Chris is relevant to this story. He needs these glasses. Okay, I see an eight in this one. I see an eight. Okay, okay there that's we go. good. <clears throat> that's something. Yeah, I saw one of them. Wow. And you know what's crazy is I set color balance and I do green screening and I do a lot of things in my day-to-day job that are very involved with color. <laughs> yeah. So, take that as you will. <laughs> well, there's various levels. You can be... I mean, these glasses don't cure it. They have there are some red green green, sorry, colorblind people who have some there's different types of cones in your eyes that actually pick up different colors and are able to differentiate them. And if you are completely missing them, then you are completely red green colorblind. But for people who have a little bit of these cones, these glasses will help. Hmm. Now they weren't actually designed or you know, created for colorblindness. It actually was was created to further amplify the eye's ability to see blood under the skin, sort of removing the visual noise of a blood signal through, you know, imaging or camera work or things like that. Huh. So they were making it to do that, and then they were testing it to see, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? You know, does it look better? And suddenly they had all these feed, all this feedback from, uh, you know, red, red, green, colorblind people who went, hey, this actually helps. I can, I can differentiate the, differentiate the colors now. So then they started kind of looking at that off to the side. That's incredible. So, so potentially somebody like me who obviously can see a great range of color, just maybe mm-hmm. I'm, I'm <clears throat> the term my dad likes to use, who seems to have more of an issue than I do, is color deficient. Yes. Um, so maybe if I'm someone who's not color blind, but I'm color deficient, yeah, maybe this, some, is, maybe this yeah, would this work is, for me. Yeah, this is much more directed towards that. They're just kind of saying color blindness is a catchy, bring it up. Mm-hmm. So, but it's used to, it filters out in front of illuminations. So it sort of takes out all those, a lot of the stuff. So they're, it's out, so it's using two what they call ISO filters: um, oxygen ISO, hemo ISO, and they're kind of filtering the light in such a way that it's pulling the colors apart. Now it's 
also is made, it's, you know, specifically for cosmetic lightning, lighting and, you know, make the, you know, the blood work beneath the skin more salient, makes skin appear, you know, transparent, more youthful, smooth, but is also being able to stretch hmm. these specific wavelengths of color to help separate them. Hmm. Mm. I see. Huh. That is really, I guess it makes sense that you could filter it all through lenses, essentially, kind of in a way. You filter yeah. it through a lens in a way. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now, if they combine this with Google, with Google Glass, right? So you got oh, yeah. color blindness correction and Google Glass heads up information. <laughs> Heather, I'm mm-hmm. set. I'm set. Oh, yeah. I, I would buy one of these. Huh. Well, so uh, probably no word on when we're going to see anything like this come to market, right? Oh, no. I mean, this was, it's not going to harm anyway. It's not like you have to have medical testing on it or anything. But since it was a technology specifically for sort of a niche group, the you know, the cosmetic light lighting and camera work and things like that, this is sort of a side project where they went, whoa, hmm. So this is kind of a, you know, they're probably going to take this as far as they can, as quickly as they can, because it's more of a mass market, hmm. you know, medium market item that they can sell. But it'll take probably a little bit of time to design them, get them into some glasses that people will wear. Yeah, I wonder if it could go as far as something like fashion accessories, right? So, uh, or not, so you know, like when you buy when you buy glasses, you can say, "I want these the polarized version," or "I want these that do mm-hmm. that." Like, I wonder if one of the one of the treatments you could get would be color deficiency correction. Yeah, that's what I was just wondering. They have them. I mean, they're using them to bring towards uh, like sunglasses. They're already going in that direction as well. So you know, you have. You have various sunglasses you've probably worn, and they shift the the colors one way or another. And, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. these would specifically try to keep more um, specific colors, you know, more natural colors, so they're not shifted in any direction. But it makes you wonder: they're doing it to the sunglasses. Might they be able to do it? Combine it with a prescription? It seems like it would certainly be possible. Yeah. Maybe we'll find out. As I shift my glasses, I'm like, hmm. Do you have any colorblind issue or any color deficiency no. issue? No. No, but just sort of in general. Well, you if you some, only knew my someday, pain, Heather. If you only someday, knew. Poor Chris. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll have it on the camera switcher one day. <laughs> and it, it'll all be happier. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if I could get just integrated into my display, <laughs> then I'd solve my problem, wouldn't it? Then I wouldn't have to go. worry about it. I wouldn't even have to worry glasses. Yeah. All right, Heather, well, any other thoughts on that one? No, I don't think so. All right, folks, well, you can find more information, including a link to the uh, colorblind test video if you want to test yourself in the show notes. But uh, why don't we uh, take a pause right there? Because I have something really cool, really cool to announce. I'm very excited to say oh, that yeah. uh, for uh, to celebrate episode 100 of the TechSnap program, we are doing a limited edition TechSnap 100 t-shirt. And uh, it is available for $13.37. And that's a little uh, little geek joke. It's thirteen thirty-seven. <laughs> Spells late. Just saying. Just saying. Anyways, uh, well, so we uh, we launched it this morning around nine a.m. Uh, JBHQ time, and uh, by three p.m. JBHQ time, we had met our hundred dollar uh, reserve, which is what we needed to be able to just print the shirts. And uh, we're taking orders for twenty more days. We have twenty hours and twenty days and twenty-two hours as uh, we record this episode. You can go over to uh, teespring.com/slash/techsnap100, or I, I'll try to remember to put a link in the show notes here. And uh, we'll only be offering it for 20 days. And it's just if you're a TechSnap fan and want to grab a limited run shirt, go over there and grab that and uh, celebrate episode 100 of the TechSnap wow. program. Isn't that great? Yeah. 100 episodes right in a row, too, because Alan is uh, a glutton for punishment. And uh, yep. I think I think the idea of taking time off uh, gives him the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> he won't do it. He says to me, he says he won't, he won't allow it. So there you go, Heather. So I just comply like a, like a good co-host. Okay. All right, Heather, well, let's move on to the news bite. All right. What is our story in the news bite? A bionic man. Okay, so should you be freaked out by this kind of stuff? Yes. Close your eyes because if you watch the video from the show notes, there is actually a a, a big story that is going on, a 
Are they no, building pardon. somebody? Because it looks like they're unboxing an It's arm. already built. It's sitting in the in a museum in London. They actually had a documentary about it. So it's it's got, you know, prosthetic arms, prosthetic legs. Huh. And in addition, it has a prosthetic trachea. It has... Gross. Ooh, gross. Yeah, it has a functioning blood circulatory system. It has a pancreas. It has a kidney. It has a spleen. All these different organs that they're making to... Um, pros, you know, prosthetics. Or, so they built a robot with with a with a circulatory system. Yes. Yes. So wow. if they're making all these different things that can, you know, aid people. You know, for obviously the prostheses, and specifically, it kind of came about because the guy who is in charge had to have um, was born without a left hand, I believe. Okay. And so he. Oh yeah, he there. Through, yeah, yeah. I see that now. Yeah, he's got sort of a prosthetic arm himself. Yeah. So we've been working, you know, how to get better and the top of the line stuff. So you have them where they can have sensors on your, on your arm and different triggers. I mean, the the nervous system is still there, so huh. it still sends some signals. So you can make it have signals so that you can open and close a hand or move it up and down or rotate the wrist. And they're smart ankles that learn how to adapt to what you're how you're walking the and terrain knees. or whatever wow yeah and then all the obviously the uh the organs that i was mentioning they've got or- artificial hearts they're literally plastic and they kind of pump the blood for you and i've seen those but i was quite surprised that they had multiple other ones you know the the pancreas the kidney they're fairly close to being able to have it completely working for human beings and that would be definitely one that would pop up because that's another organ that a lot of people need hmm. transplants for. Hmm. So it would sort of be in addition to your quasi-working kidneys, they could put this in hmm. and it would give a boost instead of another kidney donation. Now, some of these are, you know, right now they're permanent. Some of them right now are more likely um, crutches, essentially. Can you know how oh, you're waiting on an organ donation list? These will kind of get you a little farther, let you... Let you get by for a little longer. Yeah, so until uh, possibly an organ comes up for you to be able to use. But so this is one of those stories where there are so many different things coming around, coming together for, you know, people as in, you know, helping them for some sort of organ failure or, you know, prostheses or something. But all together in this, it is a six foot six inch humanoid that was kind of creepy in a creepy sort of way so Mm. the the guy in charge of this project he actually at some later point in the project they're molding a face and they said oh by the way we based it off of you it does look like him yep so it's a little bit different so then he was like wait it looks like me hmm so you can see him facing each other kind of like uh (laughs) data and and uh, dr soon yeah. Once again, science and Star Trek. There we go. It's coming together. <laughs> I just appreciate you entertaining me instead of ridiculing me. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the science just has to roll with it. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting that as they're building parts for these machines, they're developing organs that could potentially be actually used in humans. Yeah. Well, this one specifically, I think, was more the other direction it was someone saying wow look how many different things there are let's see if we put them all together what happens and it's obviously very very clunky Mm -hmm. and it's a giant you know box for a chest Mm -hmm. but it's kind of interesting that they have all these different things coming together so I'm looking forward to seeing yeah, kind of what and, other... And I wonder, too, if it in some way sort of validates the way, you know, things have been put together by nature. Mm-hmm. That, you know, when, when science looks at looks at something and says, boy, you know, if we were going to build this and we wanted to accomplish a circulatory system and we wanted to, you know, have, you know, responsive ankles and things like that, well, we would probably build these systems in. And it's almost like uh, validating just the way things are just built in nature in some sense. And at the same time, it also makes sense that if you have something that's going to operate in our environment, something that's going to be 
theoretically subservient to us, that it would be highly adaptable and compatible with that environment. And anything you can do to make it more like us is going to mean it can use our tools, it can use our screwdriver, our hammer. You know, it can it can do mm-hmm. all the it can put the gas in my car, it can wash my dishes <laughs> because it has hands and it, it can stand well, the, and it's about my height and all these kinds of things. I mean, look at the robonaut up on the space station. I've talked about it a few times in the past, where it's essentially, you know, a robot, but it has hands and fingers and articulation so that essentially in the end they will be able to put him outside and sort of roll him up and down various parts oh, yeah, yeah, right. of the station. And you can use the same tools as the astronauts. Have right, used. same thing. Same, sw- you know, be able to articulate for the switches. The so you're not having to double up on instruments. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have to have a screwdriver that I can use and a screwdriver that the robot can use. It's one and the same. But in the end, this guy put up this exhibit almost as sort of a question, saying, "All right, we're everything is kind of rapidly produ- producing, uh, sorry, progressing." So what does everyone think of this? Hmm. You know, what do you think, where do we stand as, are we becoming, how we, more bionic can we become or how much more lifelike can robots become? Now, well, and not who's technically not gonna tur- bionic. Well, who's going to turn down, like if you have a failing kidney or a failing liver or a bad mm-hmm. knee, well, who's going to turn down a you know a brand new zero mileage bionic part that's going to last as long as you are? Nobody's going to yeah. turn that down. I have a family member who just had complete knee replacement and is going to have another one. So I mean, that's... And if they could have a robotic you know hydro, you know super powered mm-hmm. knee that was yeah. the, you know once the cost gets down, that's yeah. as good. It's going to last forever. Why wouldn't they do that? And, well, the and is that is that a moral question there, or is that just a practical? Hey, I need a new knee, and 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 the technology is now such that it's easy for me to do this. It's cheap. I think I think the more morality part of it comes where I'm really accident prone, and I'm not strong. Can I replace my perfectly good arm with something massively much stronger, and then I will be a super science person uh, that yeah, can we, lift yeah. tall buildings with a single bound? When you start getting to the replacing good parts. Yes. Yeah. And so you're replacing perfectly good parts in a person just to, quote unquote, improve or change yourself or how much more lifelike or how. It would probably happen in the military first, wouldn't it? Or or, or that type of application, that extreme situation. That's probably where you'd see it first is, well, we need them to be able to run just a little faster. We need them to be able to carry a few more pounds, you know, that kind of thing. Well, they've got the enhanced things where they're trying to have the exoskeletons. Yeah. Yeah. That can be used for people who don't have the, literally don't have the strength to stand or walk or, you know, are paralyzed or something. And then you have it where it also boosts. So now the military can, you know, lift things or run farther. So there's that morality part of it. And then there is pulling back. It's like, here's a bionic, you know, or a robot. How much closer to human can you get before it gets... Yeah, you know, if I could have like a, a part of my brain cut out and replaced with a chip so I never had to sleep ever, I think I would do that. I think I would do that because that would make me so much more productive. <laughs> <laughs> I could do so much more if I never had to sleep. What about your body? Then well, you would I, need replacement parts. Well. Because if you're going constantly, you know, your legs would be like, huh, Chris. No, I pretty much always sit in this chair anyway, so. <laughs> well, how about your uh, camera switching hand? <laughs> well, they'd be like, please, right? right. <laughs> no more camera switching for you. <laughs> I'll have to get her. Oh, I'll just have to get a bionic arm, I guess. Yeah, see, fastest switcher in the West. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, any other thoughts on that one? No, it's just kind of interesting to see where these things are going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's for sure, Heather. All right, then. Well, let's move on to the two bite news. <laughs> All right, so uh, what are we going to talk about in the two-byte news? All right, dinosaurs being taken out by an asteroid, but maybe by a two, one-two punch. So there are binary asteroids. Okay, there binary are, asteroid, okay. Are, yep, there are many. 15% of the observable asteroids we see are actually binaries. Okay. So there are two 
small asteroids rotating around each other. But when you start looking at craters on Earth, only about 2 to 4% of them are binary. So there's a fairly large discrepancy of, you know, 2 to 4 to 15. So now they're kind of looking back and saying, well, maybe some of these craters are actually binaries. Now, if they're close enough together, when they strike, they'll kind of look like one. They'll kind of look like one or a deformed one. Mm. So specifically looking at the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan, which is what they believe is maybe probably part of the, at least part of the situation that killed off the dinosaurs. So they were able to find that under the surface. You know, that was kind of strange because they were looking for something on the ground. Mm. They couldn't see anything big enough. Mm -hmm. And around the edge of these large craters, you'll have, you'll expect to have um, cavern systems, like underwater cavern systems. And they're like that in the Yucatan Peninsula there near the city of Chicxulub. And they once they started mapping them out, they actually saw they were in a giant arc. So then they looked at, you know, the surface underneath the ocean as well. And that's when they spotted this giant crater. So they went, aha, that is the size that it might actually do it. But now they're looking and they're saying, it's not a perfect mm-hmm, circle. Mm-hmm. It's kind of squashed and differently shaped. Almost looks like a so, peanut. Yeah, so it's possible that it was actually two that struck. There's a yeah new set of researchers that pulled up some, some data and made some calculations and say, well, actually, our computer simulation shows that it's possible that if you had the same mass, so you have one giant one or two medium-sized ones, about the same mass, if they came together fairly close to each other, then the crater would essentially look the same, just a little elongated. So it's certainly possible that they have a situation that fits the bill. It says you can have them of this size, this far apart, hitting in this area, and it would be essentially the same. It would just look a little bit different. Right. What's the practical difference, though? Because, I mean, what's the difference of that than just, say, a large meteorite? Is there much other than just the fact that it's double bad luck? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because it's like, you know, a meteor hitting the Earth is bad, but two of them together, how are you ever going to recover from that? Yeah. Well, some of it draws back to, let's look at this one, because it is very large and studied. But if it looks like that, then go back and look at all the other craters here on Earth. I see. And kind of look and see if maybe some of the other ones that we assumed were single asteroid impacts or actually binary asteroid impacts. Yeah, and that was sort of bridge the gap between the 2 to 4% that we see now and the actual 15% out there in the solar system. So it's kind of a recalculation going, well, actually... We just sort of made the assumption that Hmm. all of these are just single asteroids. But now let's look back and say, actually, this one is a little elongated. So it makes sense that this one might be a dual binary asteroid. Well, it makes you think, Heather. It makes you think that maybe, uh, maybe we should be, instead of looking for just that one big one to hit, we should be looking for the two big ones to hit, right? (laughs) Or two medium ones, either way. Nothing's oh, good. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Any combination. Well, so what you're saying is is uh, still be scared. Yes. Yeah, any day now. Either either no. the sun's going to change by 1% or we're going to have a binary asteroid impact. So, okay, technically binary is of the same mass as a singular. Right, right. Singular. Right. Just equal scariness. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Equal Just scariness. More bad luck. All right, well, maybe something that can cheer me up is uh, sort of a way to bring the old pen and paper into the new century. Yes. So when used with a special paper, there are some pens that can record every scribble you write with a built-in camera Mm -hmm. and also can record the audio at the same time. So it kind of syncs the two up. Oh, that'd be great for school notes. Yes. Now, they have been around for a little while, but they have come out with... 
um, then they sort of synced up to your computer. Now, there are new ones in that line that actually sync up to Evernote, which is an internet-based night oh, yeah. note-taking Love Evernote. storage system. Love Evernote. We've, we did yeah, a so Jupiter Night about that. it. We did years ago. Yeah, so you can send up to you know, 500 megabytes of data, about 70 hours worth of recording, 10,000 pages of notes. And so you can, it's kind of funny, you can watch the video and it's specific paper. You can't just pull out, yeah, you know, Joe Schmo right. notebook. Yeah, the camera, the, the it, camera looks at some of the stuff on the paper. Yeah, and at the bottom of the page, there's like record button, stop button. So you go down there and you like tap this little part of the paper. Mm -hmm. and then you go up and start writing. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because you can sit there and, you know, you draw a picture and you're talking about it. And then you pull it up on your on your computer and it starts drawing at about the same, the same rate and it reads that back to you. It's kind of a neat idea. And, you know, if, especially if you're faster writing than you are typing. I think I'm actually faster typing myself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you have to draw a diagram or you know yes. something a little more complex, it's very nice for that. Kind of makes me, it's like one of those things I'd love to have in my back pocket, like if I ever needed it. Yeah, this is definitely, I'd say, like I connect it more towards, like you were saying, the drawings, the schematics, that kind of a thing. So that it's easy to draw it out on paper and then pull it up to the computer. Is it actually available for purchase? Yes, they have them smart for purchase. Pen? Hmm, the smart pen, huh? It is I available am almost for certainly. purchase. Yes. yes, you know what? We should put one in the show notes. There you go. <laughs> I don't know how much they are. <clears throat> well, they're not super cheap. Uh, yeah. It's a hundred. This one's a hundred and well, it depends on it depends on the size because they also include built-in storage. Yes. So if you get the one with four gigabytes, a pen with built-in storage. If you get the one with four gigabytes, uh, that bad mama jamma is a hundred and ninety bucks. But if you get the one with two gigs, that's only a hundred and ten bucks. So that's not bad. Yeah. So I have seen that it can be slow to transfer recordings, which, you know, anything with syncing technology from a pen, I would I would expect some transfer problems mm. on occasion. And well, also it does require that specific paper. Now they say you can print it out with the proper patterns. So they'll, there's a, I guess there's some sort of template that you can print it out yourself. Okay, so that's not so bad. And, and you, you know, the thing about the pen you have to remember is it's uploading images. Yes. And Evernote is really good about going through and detecting all of, all of the characters in an image. The only problem is Evernote is not available for Linux. However, they do have a good web client, and there are some freebie uh, uh, Evernote implementations available for Linux. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, but they have a they have a good Mac and Windows client. Yeah. All right, should we move on to a little Alzheimer's news? Let's go. Okay. What do we got? So, recent study has shown, we've talked about these amylo amyloid proteins. They clump up on the, mm -hmm. you know, in the brain, and that's what they're looking at causes or makes worse this, mm -hmm. you know, the disease. A recent study shows that the natural chemicals in green tea or red wine may actually disrupt a key step in that pathway. So they're, these little amyloid balls latch onto the surface of nerve cells and, you know, by attaching to the proteins on the surface, they're called prions or prions. So what they're looking is that their the specific shape of them is necessary to sort of attach. So it's literally like a puzzle. Hmm. You need a specific puzzle piece to snap in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're looking at these you know, these extracts might adjust those shapes. So it tweaks it just enough that you can't put it in the puzzle piece anymore. So it sort of disrupts the actual shape, which keeps them from attaching. And so they're seeing that, in fact, when they start forming, that they sort of attach, they sort of snowball effect that more and more attach to it. So just by reshaping them, they can't attach to the nerve cells. That one doesn't attach. Others can't feed off of it. So does this mean we might hear down the road green tea helps fend off Alzheimer's? Well, the story says don't stock up on the green tea or the red wine quite yet. Mm. Oh, yeah, red wine too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so don't use that as an excuse. You can't get them both. But Green tea in the morning, red wine in the evening. I think that works just fine. Science, science does not uh, <laughs> promote drinking. I got to do it from my mind, honey. Leave me alone. 
This does not promote drinking. Oh, darn it. <laughs> hey, science was humoring you earlier, <laughs> and now it comes back. All right, all right. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. But, so they're, this is just another one of those situations where they're looking at getting the interactions between these neurons and these amyloid proteins sort of disruptions. So there's a lot of different things going on where they're looking at how to clear them out, how to disrupt them sticking to each other. So each of this is just another step sort of coming in on the on the main problem, sort of hoping to either slow down right. or, or, you know, essentially immunize you. Figuring out everything that can combat it or at least uh, – and looking at things that help and why they, why, what it is about them that makes them helpful. Yes. Fascinating. Well, keep us posted on that one. Definitely. Impacts us both. All right, Heather, well, let's move on to a little uh, viewer feedback because the Side by 2000 has the uh, incoming communications light flashing. All right, what do we have this week, Heather? All right. Jason, a.k.a. Tubesta, Tubesta. from the chat room. Yep. Mm-hmm. Asks, shouldn't you use metric measurements in your science show? Oh. Because pretty much stick to standard in the show. Yeah. So there's a couple of things here. One, you can always find the metric in the show notes. (laughs) 98% of the time, I have them both there. Okay. There's the standard and the metric sitting next to each other. I should have known. Of course, they're in the show notes. The show notes has everything. (laughs) The show notes is the place to be. It is the 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 awesome it should I don't know if it should be called the show notes it's almost like I mean it's just so incredible there's so much stuff in there okay yes but I should probably include both in the show more often a, a while back I was I was mm-hmm. doubling up on you know three feet one meter except it sort of I started stumbling upon my words mixing them up a lot well and you're probably you know you're not you're not in or do you work with metric I guess you might work with metric I, don't I work know. with both okay. So, it would just throw me off all the time. Yeah, so, but that's part of the problem is there's a majority of the audience that is from the U.S. Mm-hmm. And if I did strictly metric measurements, totally untangible, I might as well say it is for Hoopa Choops long. Because <laughs> some people are just not going Hoopa to get Choops. it immediately. <laughs> what? Oh, I, that. <laughs> I like Hoopa Choops a lot. <laughs> okay. That's a good one. No. The problem is the opposite because outside the U.S., the standard metrics probably aren't meaning a whole yeah, bunch, not right. extremely tangible. Now, much more reasonable that they understand because us Americans are stubborn and hand thumps table. We do feet and miles and pounds. And so a lot of people go, uh, fine, we kind of have an idea of what, what that is. Mm-hmm. So They tolerate it. They tolerate it. Yes, there's definitely toleration to a degree. Which we appreciate. <laughs> yes. And probably some eye rolling as well. Yes, that's understandable too. So, it, it is kind of goofy. Yeah. So I will make an effort to do it a little more often. But as I said, it's in the show notes. So I look right past it. I read it right there. But I may not do it every time just because if I'm talking at a certain rate or trying to say other words that are going to make my tongue be unhappy science, then I might skip over that. But I will put an effort into doing it more often. But as I said, it is always in the show notes. Head there to check them out. So you'll be able to get a better idea of how many Hoopa Choops that is long. Right. We can all learn the Hoopa Choop system together. Yes. And hopefully you won't mix the two because I know people who mix them. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was do. I thought it was a fifty-five hoopa choop zone, and I was doing. I was doing sixty-five hoopa choop. I got in trouble. Oh no! I mean, like pounds per meter. You know, someone who wants, you know, in pounds per meter. I'm like, no, pounds <laughs> per foot. Yeah. Or kilograms per meter, please. No, <laughs> wants to mix them up. <laughs> I think you should just start putting everything in Hoopa Choop and just call it good. <laughs> just you know what the internet measurement system is Hoopa Choop. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> All right, Heather. Well, uh, so if folks want to email us, they can they can contact the show SciBite at jupiterbroadcasting.com or go uh, just to the main page and hit the contact link and choose SciBite in the drop down list. Should we uh, blast off to uh, Mars? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. 
Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. I know it. I know it. It's, okay. What? It was Nothing. a wheel. Were, were you talking to the clip? That would Maybe. be very unprofessional. I would never encourage that, Heather. I would never encourage that. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you weren't either. <laughs> All right. So what's Curiosity up to this week? All right. Some drilling prep. They're, and they've actually drilled their first sample. So in preparation for drilling a hole on Mars, back on Earth, they bored more than 1,200 holes in 20 different types of rock here on Earth. Mm. So they made a lot of testing, you know, repeat testing, make sure everything worked they thought the way they thought it would mm-hmm. and how it acted in various types of rock. So they have, in this drill, there's two different things going on. There's a percussive, so it's sort of banging it like a hammer. And then there's rotation, so it's drilling it like, you know, like you have a Dremel, Dremel mm, mm-hmm. drill and you're drilling a hole in the wall, hopefully with purpose. So what they're able to do is a mini drill test, which I actually used, last week we talked about a test that was just the progressive. So it was just like a hammer tapping the rock. Mm-hmm. And then the mini drill test happened is they're able to combine both to make a 0.8 inch, 2 centimeter uh, deep hole in a little patch of the sedimentary be- bedrock. Mm. So they're able to look at what was going on. They were able to see this rock was in an area that you know, there's evidence of wet environmental conditions. So this is definitely an interesting area to see. So then they were able to, in the end, produce a hole about uh, 0.6 inches or 1.6 centimeters wide, two and a half inches, six and a half centimeters deep in this rock. And then you have this rock power ge- powder generated from all this drilling. Yeah. It flies up the flutes. You know, you drill a hole in, you know, the wall or in wood, and there's a whole bunch of shavings or powder mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the rock. It travels back up the flutes, and it sits there. Now, what they do is that's what a lot of the interest is in, is that powder. Oh. So they get that, and there's they made the drill in such a way is that some of the powder that comes up it is actually captured by the instruments. Of course. Clever. So, so of course, they do this. the first drill or some of it. They did the swish and clean. We've talked about this when they did um, the scooping or some of the other uh, things that they've done. Right. So they scoop it up. They kind of coat all the instrumentation inside with Mars dust, and they kind of dump it out. That's sort of to make everything Mars instead of Earth. So if there was anything of Earth in there, they've kind of dumped Mars on it, washed <laughs> it with a little bit of Mars dust, I, and then made the Earth yeah. go away. They're, they're whitewashing it with Mars. I, I mean, yes. they're, yeah, they're kind of getting rid of all the, just trying to equalize it all out. Yes. So then they're able to go through and analyze it. They'll go through and transfer some of the powder into um to be able to see what's there. So inside of a sample handling device, vibrated over a sieve, so you can get a specific particle size. And then portions of that will fall into uh, chemistry and mineral instrumentation, sample analysis. So you're able to see exactly what's there, what minerals are there, what, what they look like. So we have a better idea of, we see what's on the surface of the rock. We can do all the analysis, you know, looking at it, take the spectral spectral analysis and see what's there. But now we can also, for the first time, be able to drill into the rock and see what's underneath the surface. Because on the surface, there's been a lot of weathering. Now, on Earth, you Mm -hmm. see weathering and think, you know, rain and water. But on Mars, it's just, it's only wind. So there's wind here. So there's wind weathering on Mars. You know, it's been all the dust storms, so it's essentially sandpapered, mm-hmm. you know, clean. So there's the surface might be very different from what's underneath. Now, it's going to be similar, but there are going to be different things going on. So more pristine situation environment inside the rock, maybe. So you can drill down into it, see what's inside the rock, see things that have not been affected by the weathering on Mars. Kind of like um, it's not like this at all, but it reminds me of when we when we drill for core samples in a way, and we kind of go back and get ice from a period of time before 
you know, that has air captured from way back when. Like in, in this yes. case, we're drilling down a little bit in the rock and we're pulling out stuff that is just kind of been below the surface for a little while. So it's a little bit undisturbed. Yes, undisturbed. And exactly as you said, we're you're also looking back in time. So it's sort of a combination of the two. Hmm. It's pretty interesting. Well, uh, I, I just love knowing that stuff's just doing science out there every single week. Yes. Curiosity Rovers. Keeps chugging along. Awesome. All right. Any other thoughts on that one? No, not yet. All right, then hop in the time machine, Heather, because okay. it's time to go back in time. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I got huh? the door shut that time. All right, good. Everybody good. We have much smoother, much much smoother trip when you get that door latched. Yes. Uh, so this one takes us to 62 years ago for this week in science, Feb- February 15th, 1951. Nuclear medical therapy. So the first atomic reactor was used in medical therapy treatment of the first patient in the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. So they're able to begin experimental treatments with uh, brain cancer using. Neutrons from the reactor. So they're able to, you know, hit the cancer with those specific neutrons. And so for two years, 10 patients were treated with this boron neutron capture therapy. Wow. They're able to study, they're able to supply all the radioisotopes needed for other research organizations and well. But it had medical uses. Hmm. You know, obviously, and there were some others. But it was the world's first reactor dedicated specifically for peaceful exploration of atomic energy. So it was used for, you know, just... Oh, instead of like a bomb or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't for yeah. specifically news about that. This was 1952? Yes. Wow. 1951. Oh, 1951. Was, 1951, okay. Well, and 52, because it kept going. Well, yeah, I suppose, I suppose. I wonder if that has, I suppose, I suppose not the... Uh, the Adams for Peace program, I guess, actually was established before 1952, but that was also for, it was it was to lead to atom reactors to be used in medical applications. So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, there you go. All right, Heather. Well, that was the week back in science. That must mean it's time to look up into the sky this week. That's right. This week is a, a little of a, a slow week, but you'll see a couple of planets in the early twilight look low to the west-southwest to see Mercury. Now, if you, about sunset, going a little bit farther, Mars will be. To, Mars is actually on the far side of the sun, so it's getting harder and harder to see. But in Jupiter, is a little bit more exciting. In the early evening, look high in the southern skies, and to its left is Aldebaran. And I keep mentioning that one because it is an orange star. So over oh, there by yeah. Jupiter is not actually Mars. Right. And Saturn, you'll be able to see around midnight. Now, it's going to rise in the east to southeast, a little to the lower left of the star Spica, which is a really bright star. But by dawn, it'll be kind of highest in the south. In the south. So around midnight, you'll see in the east to southeast, be two bright objects. Saturn is actually lower to the left because it is you know, more grounded because it's a planet. And the star is actually far away, so it's higher in the sky. But by dawn, you'll see Saturn moving to the south. Very good. And Heather has a little graphic in the show notes that kind of helps illustrate some of this. For looking west, southwest. Yes. Right, Heather? Okay. Wow. There's the whole show, yeah? I think so. Now, uh, Heather is on Twitter if you want to contact her throughout the week, jb underscore mars underscore base, or you can email the show, scibyte at jupiterbroadcasting.com. But really, and I want to say thank you to our live stream. We've had a great uh, chat room going this week. You're always welcome to join us on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv for the video or jblive.info for the audio. And then, of course, we're available for download on Wednesday mornings. And Heather, thank you for the great show. Thank you. All right, well, thank you to everyone for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. Don't forget about that TechSnap 100 episode t-shirt. That'll only be available for a limited time. And uh, be sure you tune in right back here next week. <laughs>